Today I'm going to be sharing a story that is familiar to most. And obviously it's a story because I like stories. And Jesus told him parables for a reason. And if Jesus told stories, then that's good enough for me. So we are at the beginning of the story. We find Jesus. It says a few days after Jesus healed a man with leprosy, he again entered into Capernaum. Now, Capernaum or was a place where Jesus grew up. That was his neighborhood. So Jesus basically went home. Uh, so he just performed a miracle. He got on a boat. Then he went home to Capernaum. And he went. And when everybody heard that he was home, the people got excited. Now, can you imagine if, uh, uh, if you knew that like a famous pastor was coming, Henry Wright or somebody was coming to preach, this church would be packed. Um, I know that when we go to camp meeting and, 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 and people even wake up at 6 o'clock on a Sabbath morning to go and book a seat for the worship service, then some stay from the 6 o'clock prayer all 9 o'clock because they want to reserve that seat. So cause that's because there's a, a, a famous speaker, a powerful speaker whom God uses mightily. This wasn't different. People knew Jesus um, was mighty. They'd heard stories about him and he was going back to his hometown. Now, we told um, through reading and, and, through, and Bible scholars would say that Jesus was at the home of Peter. Who was Peter? Anybody? Peter? He was one of his disciples. Thank you, Chair. Peter was one of Jesus' disciples. And what kind of guy was Peter? Peter was rough, right? Thank you, Inka. He was a rough guy. He was a, a fisherman. And fishermen were not the, the richest members of society. So what kind of neighborhood do you imagine Peter would have lived in? Would it, would it have been, thank you, that's the word I'm looking for. Peter lived in the ghetto. Yeah. So Jesus is hanging out and, 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 and he's staying in somebody's house in the ghetto. And you know what, that's good enough for me because if Jesus can stay in somebody's house in the ghetto, then he can, he can stay in my house. He can stay in your house because Jesus is not a respecter of person. So Jesus goes into Peter's house and he's hanging out in the ghetto. All, all his, if you excuse me, all his homies from the day run, run and come to see him. Hey, our homeboy is around. The carpenter guy, this is the guy that fixed my chair. He's in town. I, I heard that he's been, he's been healing people and he healed a leper and he's been doing all sorts of stuff. This is my guy. I want to see this guy. What's happened to him? He was just an ordinary guy. Let's see. So there's a crowd in his house and people want to hear. Now, in the house, uh, Jesus was into discipling. He had his 12 disciples. We know that, right? So he's got his 12 disciples. And so when, whenever Jesus would operate, he would sit in a place, and around him would be his 12 disciples because he was about teaching them primarily. But in this occasion, we read that they gathered in such a place numbers that there was no room, not even outside the door. Luke 5, verse 17 says, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. Okay, so you have Jesus in the middle, then you have Pharisees and the teachers of the law as a second layer, and then it says after that, and then, oh, the Pharisees had come from every village of Galilee. So we had the disciples, and you had the Pharisees who had come from every village in Galilee, from Judea and from Jerusalem. Now, that, that's a, an amazing thing. So you have Peter's house, in the ghetto, you have Jesus there, there's his disciples, then there's all these Pharisees and, and all these delegates. So you have your SEC president, you have and your personnel, you have your, your NEC, you have your BAC stuff, you have your TED. They've come to see this new preacher to see what is going on. They've heard so much about him. He's done wonders in their house and they want to test him out. Is this guy legit? What is, what is he about? What is he really about? So they gather there. So Jesus is teaching in the house of Peter. And it says, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Now it says in another version of the Bible that the power of the Lord was available to heal. Okay, so you have Jesus sitting there and in him and around him is this power that is available to heal. You have next to him the disciples, you have the Pharisees, and you have people um, the ordinary crowd from his neighborhood who come to see there. So you have three types of people there, but Jesus is there with power just going out of him. And, and I know this for a fact, because when the woman with the issue of blood just touched the hem of his garment, Jesus didn't even speak a word, but because of her faith, the power just diffused out of Jesus into that woman on the wall. Do, do we agree? So power, Jesus had power. He's there with his, with his power. I'm going to play on that later. But the word for power is actually dunamis, the Greek word, I'm not a Greek student, I read this on, 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 in, in my reference books. The word is dunamis, which is the word that is used for, 
for that we use for dynamite or from which we derive the word dynamite. So Jesus is sitting there and then this dynamite available to heal. The healing power is like dynamite. And what do we know about um, dynamite? Boom! It's an explosive power. So Jesus is sitting there and, and, and the, while he's calm and teaching, there's this explosive power available to heal. Okay. And there's nobody tapping onto the power. Okay, so the Pharisees were there, but why were the Pharisees there? The Pharisees are there for a particular reason. They're close to him, and they were the scribes who were the doctors of the law. These were the guys who had PhD in Jewish laws and traditions, and they knew their Bible inside out. These were the scholars. And why were they there? Were they there? They, you had this young upside preacher who was causing a commotion, and they wanted to challenge him based on what they knew about the law and the, and, and the, and the Torah as it, as it was back then. What did I say to you? Jesus was sitting next then his, his, his uh, disciples and then the, the scribes and the Pharisees and then the crowd. Now, ne the, the disciples were next to him and he says that power is available to heal. But what, what we find as we read this story and as Christian told this story, how many people were healed? One. So Jesus is sitting there in this crowd and there's a crowd around him. His disciples are there, the scribes and Pharisees are there, but only one person is healed. And do you know what that says to me? Is that being close to Jesus, even though power is available to him. Being close to Jesus doesn't mean that you necessarily have the access to that power. It's possible to come to church and rub shoulders with Jesus. You may even hug Jesus, yeah. But unless you have a relationship with Jesus, being close to Jesus means nothing. You, you, you can't access that power. Thank you, darling. I'll be back. So, what happens next? Some men come to Jesus carrying a paralyzed man. And, the, and this man was carried by four of them on a mat. And they tried to take him to the house to lay him before Jesus. Now, this guy is paralyzed, right? And I looked up the word paralysis, and it says a loss or impairment of voluntary movement in a body part caused by injury or disease of the nerves, brain or spinal cord. A disease or paralysis is also a disease characterized by this and it's been called palsy. So this paralyzed guy had, had lost voluntary movement. His entire body, he was there, he just couldn't move and it, it was by disease. And we know from reading the Spirit of Prophecy the chapters that are put up there, that he was there because of his own behavior. His condition was a result of his sin. So there was a link between his sin and his physical conditions. And my submission to you and most psychologists will, will, will confirm that what happens in the mind happens, affects the body. Is that true? Okay. Do we have any nurses here or doctors? Any nurses in the house? What is psychosomatic disease? I see you. I see you, sister. That is a, a hand of faith. I see you. There's a nest right there in Jesus' name. What is psychosomatic? What do you understand by psychosomatic? Okay, he's a general nurse. I work in, I'm not a nurse, but I work in, in mental health. Um, we have one, but she's hiding. A psychosomatic disease, we have two people that work in mental health that I can see in the congregation. A psychosomatic disease is something that happens here that ends up affecting the rest of the mind. Have you ever been so sick that you can't get out of bed? Have you ever been so depressed that you can't get out of bed? What is happening in here, in here, has affected this. And you're, and you're rigid and, and paralyzed. So this, 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 paraly uh, this um, paralytic had, was sick here, and it eventually affected his body. And it was a consequence of his own sin. And as he lay in bed paralyzed, he pondered his life, and he blamed itself. And we read that he actually went to the doctors, and he asked to be treated. He went to the priest and asked to be prayed for. He went to the elders and said, please anoint me with oil, as the word says. I want to be healed. And these guys couldn't do it. And do you know what? In the end, they, they just kicked him to the curb and said, you know what, it's your fault. You are in this position because of what you did. We don't have to touch you. We have nothing to do with you. You are cursed by God. So he's lying there. I was going to lie on the thing, but it's already been shown. He's lying there, paralyzed, unable to move because of what he had done. And he knows this. And despair fills his heart. 
but he's lying there and he's reflecting over his lives. But I want to praise God for good friends. Yes. God sent him good friends. Um, he says that his friends came. And other versions of the Bible said his friends came and four of them lifted up. So it is possible that there were more than four friends. But I'm just going to say that there was four friends there. So his friends came. And his friends started to tell him about Jesus and what Jesus had done. And they started preaching to him and say, God, your condition doesn't have to be permanent. Jesus can heal you. Jesus can touch you. So he lay there in bed and they're, they're working on him. His brain still works, even though his body is paralyzed by what he's done. His brain still functions. And as he lies there paralyzed, he, hope fills in his heart and it swells up. And, 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 then, and then he says, well, let's do something. Let's go see him. Because uh, they hear that Jesus is in town. So all his friends, what do they do? They pick up, they pick this guy up and they take him to see Jesus. Now, where did I say Jesus was? He's in Peter's house. He's in the ghetto. Yeah, Jesus was in the ghetto. So he, this guy now, they, they pick him up and they moved. We read, I think it's, it is the, the Spiritual Prophecy, Volume 2. It says that this man was a wealthy man. Do wealthy people live in the ghetto? No. Okay. So we have a, a, a rich guy, and maybe that's, there's a lesson right there. This guy is wealthy, but his wealth cannot help or heal his paralysis. He's paralyzed, but wealthy. He's got tons of money. He opened his bank account, and, and his credit rating has a credit rating. His money is that good. His money is that good. So having wealth and having um, worldly possession is not a guarantee that things are going to be okay with you spiritually. So this is a wealthy guy. And of course, he's got, if he's a wealthy guy, more than likely he has wealthy friends. So this, this guy and his wealthy friends, they pick him up. And they pick him up bodily. Okay, can you imagine the, just the shame of being picked up bodily? I, when I first came to, to England from Zim, my family, when I first came for, to the UK, one of the jobs that I did was, was care work. Okay, and as somebody that, and, and, and I, always, I always wonder, reflecting, why did God take me through this journey? Uh, I, I, was, I was doing care work and I had to bathe people and then you go to this old guy and then he's messed himself and you have to change, change him and, and, and clean him. And, and I would cry unto the Lord and say, Lord, save me from this affliction. And I, and I wondered why, 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 why God had to put me through that. But then I, I guess he wanted to break me so he could mold me. Because if I could stoop to do that job, I can do any job. Um, I've cleaned toilets in England. Anybody? Yeah. I've had to clean toilets in England just to make a living. So if I can change somebody's... It's not a diaper with a grown-up. What's it called? Diaper. If I can change a, gr a grown person's diaper and I can clean the toilet, I can do any job in, in God's house. I'm not too proud. So God had to break me because I was a proud person. Because I was a right in Zim, middle class, doing right, good friends. But God had to, be, to, be, to break me so he could use me. Now, the indignity, I thought it was, uh, it was undignified for me to clean those guys. But can you imagine what it felt like for those guys who were being cleaned? Yeah. I can't imagine having had having, having somebody wash me. I love my wife, but God forbid she has to wash me. Come on now. There's some things a guy has to do for himself. But, so this, this was not a dignified thing. So you have this paralyzed guy stuck, and his friends are having to do everything to, for him. His, his family have to wash him. They have to feed him. They have to clothe him. He can't do anything for himself. Now we read in the ministry of healing, that this paralysis is actually a metaphor for our Christian condition. There are people in the church who are paralyzed, and they come to church every Sabbath. They want us to feed them. They want to be cleaned. They want to be carried everywhere because they're paralyzed. And it says that how they get paralyzed is through inactivity. And that scared me as I was reading it. If God has given you a gift, he expects you to use it. So those that have been given gifts and failed to use it, over time, you, you know, you're not paralyzed straight away. It's not like, boom, you have a stroke, you're paralyzed. One day you're walking fine. Then the next, because you're not in active ministry, you're walking with a, with a slight limp. With a slight limp, you, you can't do it properly. You've been trying to, to, to serve God, and you're working with a slight limb. Then you can't even walk at all, and then you're paralyzed spiritually. And this is what happens when we don't use the gift that God has asked us to use. And the title of my sermon, what did I say, was Paradigm Shift. It's a time, 
And this is a fundamental change in approach or underlying assumptions. An important change that happens when the usual way of thinking about or doing something is replaced by a new and different way. We need to have a paradigm shift to stop doing worship and religion and Jesus stuff the way we've been using to, we've been doing, because this stuff hasn't worked. We're still how we are. We need to have a paradigm shift. So. This paralysis, like I said, is a loss or impairment. And I thought about that. Individual people can, can experience paralysis in a Christian sense. If I could lose a limb, if somebody comes and, and slaps me or whacks my hand, that hand hurts. And, and spiritually, I'm angry with that person. I'm no longer effective. I can't use this hand now in God's ministry because I've been paralyzed. And then I thought, with all the lesson studies I've been doing about the body and the church being the body, that paralysis can happen to a church as a corporate body. If a member is missing, and that member was the little finger in the church, this body cannot function properly. The church is basically paralyzed because that finger is gone. If a member who was a leg it goes missing or, or dies spiritually. This church now is hobbling on one leg. And the reason why maybe that our church is hobbling is because we have various limbs, pieces of our church strewn all over Milton Keynes. And we have to come to the position, have a paradigm. She always say, you know what? This body is not complete. I need to go out there and bring the other pieces of this body that are missing so that this body can function properly. Am I making sense? I'm getting all sorts of strange faces. Okay. He lost all hope of recovery, but his friends stepped in. And they carried him from the rich part of town, and, they, and, and people were laughing and said, them, are you guys crazy? What are you doing? They moved down the narrow streets, and it wasn't an easy thing to do carrying a, a grown man. Um, when we when were in high school and we were doing basketball or, or rugby training, one of the things that you used to do is you, you, carry, you do piggyback. It was easier on the basketball court, but on the rugby field, you, its grass is, is thicker on the, on the rugby field than you're wearing boots. And you have to, to run, and it's a race to, to get to the other side and back with somebody on your back. So I, that was hard. Can you imagine now four guys having to carry a fully grown man all across the winding streets of Capinaum, and, 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 and they are moving from the rich part to the poor part. Now, all their rich friends are saying to them, hey, what are you guys doing? What's this about? Why didn't you get a cart? Well, well, not really. The cart wouldn't have done it because the streets are too narrow. So they, did, they, they, they didn't care about the shame. They didn't worry about who did it. They went down this narrow path. They moved from the rich part of Milton Keynes and ended up in Fishermead, where Jesus was. And what they did is they came now to, where, to the room where Jesus was. And first of all, they, they, they see this crowd, and they try and get through the crowd, but nobody wants to let them in because they're all interested in, in listening to Jesus for themselves. They say, please, can we go in? And, and, and we, have, we have somebody disabled here that needs to come see Jesus. And people just, just sit and pretend they can't hear. They go to see if, they, if they, there's a disabled seat in the church. There's no disabled seat in the church. There are people who are not disabled sitting in the disabled seat in the, in the church. They, they come, they try everything, and, and, and the spiritual prophecy says they went around the house and they couldn't find a gap. Now, they decided, the man himself, they, they sat there like, in said, well, what do we do next? And then the, paralyzed, the guy who was paralyzed himself says to them, you know what, I have an idea. Go up on the roof. I want to, I want to take this a step back. Who brought that man to the house? His friends. His friends did everything, and, and their friend's faith took him as far as the building. But when the guy got to the building, his faith now is ignited and is fired up. And he said, you know what? You guys have brought me to church. You have brought me to the, to, to the proximity of Jesus. I'm not going to give up here. I need you to take me up higher so that I can access Jesus. Even when somebody brings you to church, to church, it is up to you now to take the next step and say, take me up higher so that I can access Jesus. So they come up with a plan and say, you know what? We'll go. He says to them, let's go up the side of the, of the house. So they go up the side of the house. And it says that the stairs were like narrow, like this narrow. So you have four guys going up a narrow side to try and get to the top of the roof. Now these houses then had flat roofs. And so they go up the flat roofs. And as Christian described, they go up the flat roof. roof and, and he says, tear the place down. Now I, look, I looked um, at the word that they described. Um, it says that the actual experience is that they unroofed the roof. 
This is what they did. They went to, that, to Peter's house and they unroofed the roof. What kind of guy was Peter? He's a fisherman. Was he a gentle, meek, and mild, loving soul? Okay, this is a rough guy. These guys wanted, were so urgent in their desire to see Jesus that they weren't scared of, the of, the, of seeing Peter that they decided to unroof the roof. They tore the roof down. Now imagine being in that prayer meeting. Jesus is there preaching. Thank you, Christian. And, the, and, the, and suddenly there's noise. And there's dust and debris. People jump out of the way and everyone is looking up and wondering what is happening and there's only one calm person. Because he wasn't surprised. Jesus, they lower the, the man down. And, and we know what happens next. But I want you to, to spend a few minutes just looking at these men. The men did not allow circumstances to dictate the, response, the responses. You know, some of us have... Uh, they, they, they didn't let what was going on. They didn't... The, the social stigma of carrying the man, the digging through the roof, being afraid of it, they didn't let that stop them. The, some of us have a Christianity that is dictated by what is happening around us. We have the Christianity of a crowd. I'm not going to the prayer meeting. And, and the, well, who's going to be there? Well, if, if so-and-so is not going to be there, I'm not going. Well, who, who are they? Only Jesus died for you. It doesn't matter who, who else is there. Who's preaching? Well, you know what? I'm going to go to bless you this Sabbath. These men also refused to be discouraged by the op opinions and comments of the people around them. They went round and everyone told them, give up. Why are you wasting your time? This place is packed. It doesn't matter what people may be saying around you. When it comes to Jesus, you, may, you have to be dogged. You have to be determined to come and experience him for yourself. What are you prepared to do to see Jesus? What are you prepared to give up? Your reputation, uh, your job. Your work hours. These guys took action. And one of the things I've learned about this particular church in particular, we, we're very good, Brother Inju, at, um, at arranging meetings. Let's have a meeting to decide about this. Oh, we, this needs to be done. Why don't we have a, a committee to do it? These guys, when, when they were carrying the they didn't say, oh, let's draw up a committee to see how this, this person is going to be carried to Jesus. They took action. There's a time for planning, and there's a time for action. We did our planning last week, and from now on, we will take, we'll go forward in action. And I like what they did also. They took the problem straight to Jesus. Because sometimes your friends aren't good enough. Your family is not, enough, is not good enough. You have to take the problem straight to Jesus. So they took the problem straight to Jesus. And when Jesus saw their faith, and that hit me, because when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Whose faith did Jesus see? The friends. This guy was healed because Jesus had respect for the friend's faith. And do you know what that says to me? When I'm dying and paralyzed, some of you can save me. Yeah. We have to be concerned about one another. If we see a brother is dying, let's be concerned enough to take them to Jesus. Your faith can save me. I need me four good men that will hold me accountable. Yeah. You need four good men. You need four good women that will hold you accountable. We are to be a brother's keeper, like I said. We are the body. If a part is missing, we have to go in. Because of the friend's faith, that guy was healed. Your faith impacts the lives of others. And you know what? You need to surround yourself with friends that have faith. I don't know what friends or, or, what friends or companions you have, but you need to surround yourself with people that will increase your faith, that have faith, that are willing to do whatever it takes to save you. Some of our friends are a waste of time. 474 contacts on my mobile phone. 474. Some of you can beat that. Uh, I have 270 friends on Facebook. Yeah. But of those, in the last week, I didn't call, I don't think I called any of the 474 contacts on my phone. I may have WhatsApped you guys to deal with the sermon. But, so are these people really my friends? A friend is concerned, and a friend is intimate, and a friend spends time with you. We need to be that kind of friend to someone. When Jesus sees him, he cuts right to the chase. He says, your sins are forgiven you. And that was like honey to a badger. Those are the words that the men wanted to hear. Because what did I say? His sin was a consequence. His paralysis was a consequence of what he's done. And what he wanted was to hear from Jesus, 
I forgive you. And he heard that, and to him that was enough. He, could have, he was there. He died and went to heaven right there. As people say, I know you don't die and go to heaven. But he, he was there. He experienced his heaven. I am, he, I am forgiven. He didn't need to be healed anymore. All he wanted was forgiveness. And Jesus sensed that's, that's what he wanted. And he cut straight to the chase, and he says, I, for, I forgive you. And then he says to him, all the, all the critics around him, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law say to themselves, what cheek? Who does this guy think he is? Saying that he can forgive sin. And, and do you know what? Theologically, they were correct. Is that, is that a fact? Theologically, it's a fact. Because only God can forgive sins. No human being, if any human being says they can forgive sins, they are lying. And, and, and they are blaspheming. It's blasphemy against God to say you can forgive um, sin. I can, if, every time I'm learning through being married, that I can say, sorry, and then she can forgive me. Okay? But if I hurt Amelia here, can Ruth forgive me? Who needs to forgive me? Amelia. Okay. So, now, if I hurt, if, if you two, or let's say you and him, you, one of you hurts the other, who, who needs to forgive who? Them. Can I say I forgive you for hurting him? No. Why not? Why can't I say I forgive you for hurting him? Why can't I say that? Thank you, John. Because I don't have the authority to do that. I don't have the authority. No one has authority to forgive anyone else of their sins other than Jesus. Because it tells us in the, in the Gospel Commission, all authority is given to me. Scripturally, these guys were right, but relationally they were wrong. Because they had God in their very presence and didn't recognize him. Because they were looking for a God after their own fashion. Knowing and understanding Scripture and the Bible is not a substitute for having a relationship with God. You can know the 28 fundamental beliefs back to front or not, and, but if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, that knowledge is not going to save you. And how you see Jesus affects how you relate to him. The paralytic saw Jesus as somebody who could heal him, and he was healed. So Jesus condemns these guys and says that he has the authority to heal, and the man is healed. And, and, and he proved by healing, he proved to them that not only had dynamics, dynamite power to heal, because I said to you before, power as was available to heal. He had that dynamite power to heal, but also he had authority to forgive sins. So Jesus stood as the healer among them. Now, you and I have a, a challenge. We can come to church for years and years. But the point is, do you and I have a relationship with Jesus? Do we understand what it means to be a minister of the gospel? Because everyone is a minister of the gospel. Everyone has been given gifts and talents with which to share God's word. God holds everybody responsible, we learn from the parable of the talents, for whatever gift you've been given. There is no excuse. There's no saying, oh, the elders must do this, the prayer ministry's team. You are the elder and the prayer ministry's team in your sphere of influence. At your school and at your workplace, you are the elder. You are the prayer ministry's leader. You are the Sabbath school leader. God has given each and every one of us gifts and talents to use in his ministry. And my challenge to you this afternoon is that you seek a deep and intimate relationship with Jesus. Everything else is going to fade away. All this stuff that we have, this is tinder. Um, we say, my brother, in Nwati. When, when, when growing up, when my grandma was starting a fire, because I grew up in the country, she would find the little uh, tinder, twigs, to start a fire. And the little twi twigs would be, would be put there, then she would strike the match. When they catch a light, she put the big slope. All this stuff that we have, these are twigs that are going to burn in hell's fire. So what is really important is that we have to have a, a relationship with God, and not just a relationship of proximity, a relationship of adjacency. Sorry, this is the last time I promise. Not just a relationship of adjacency. We need to have a relationship that, that is alive, that is breathing. Jesus says that he wants us to know him as, in, as, as, as he and the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit know, him, know one another. And, and the, the word that he uses is the word of physical intimacy between 
a husband and a wife. Thank you. Jesus wants us to have that kind of intimacy with him. So that when, I, when we make a plan, we know that he's along with the plan because he gave us the plan in the first place. This is what God wants to, uh, to happen to us. First of all, it starts with you on an individual level. Now, when you are on fire for Jesus and I'm on fire for Jesus and everyone else is on fire for Jesus, when we come together, we have a huge bonfire for Jesus. My challenge for you from this day onwards is that you get on fire for Jesus. And, and also that if you have a friend, a neighbor, a relative who's dying and not catching fire, that you be a good friend and that you lift them up and take them to Jesus. And you leave them at the feet of Jesus so that Jesus can do his thing.